20, verse 31. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The second reading is from John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks, Tanya. Welcome, church. I just broke a sweat. <laughs> I thought we were going to prepare for the 1030 uh, singing, and uh, hallelujah, God is good. Keeps us on our toes. <laughs> so we're going to start... We're going to start the Gospel of John this morning, and um, I'm privileged to, to open up the scriptures, and we're going to go through John chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, and, uh, and then Tanya and Wayne, as we continue to go through the Gospel of John over the next few months, we're just to hear in excitement what the, the Word of the Lord is for us. So I want to first open up with a quote by William Barclay. Very often on stained glass windows, the gospel writers are represented by the figures of the four beasts in Revelation around the throne in Revelation chapter seven verses, sorry, chapter four, verses seven. A common understanding is that the man stands for Mark, which is the plainest, the most straightforward and the most human of the gospels. The line stands for Matthew, for he specifically saw Jesus as the Messiah and lion of the tribe of Judah. The ox stands for Luke because it is the animal of service and sacrifice. And Luke saw Jesus as the great servant of men and the universal sacrifice for all mankind. And the eagle stands for John because it alone of all living creatures can look straight into the sun and not be dazzled. And John has the most eternal mysteries in the eternal truths and the very mind of God. Many people find themselves closer to God and to Jesus Christ in John than any other book in the world, end quote. The Gospel of John. What I want to do this morning is I want to kind of go through a, a teaching line upon line, contextual, textual um, message. So many questions come to mind when you read this gospel that perplex the theologians and still divide the greatest minds of our time. So deep that the most gifted swimmer will never reach its depths, yet so simple that a young mind can drink in deeply of its refreshing nectar. Difficult concepts are addressed in John, as he takes us through a journey to present to you a gospel that in areas overlap the other three, but yet in one area focuses on one aspect that the others do not. The gospel of John. My prayer this morning is that the Lord takes us through a journey of heart, mind, and spirit. And he leaves us refreshed and encouraged as the light of Christ reflects anew in our heart. Firstly, what I like to do is I like to lay a foundation by asking a few simple questions or answering a few simple questions. Who, what, where, when, why? So who? Tradition has it that this book is the work of the Apostle John. Now, he's actually not named at all in the book, but refers to himself as a disciple whom Jesus loved. And you can see this in John chapter 13, verses 23, 19, verses 26, 20, verses 2, and 21, verses 7. When? Some experts believe that it was written around 70 AD and the last of the Gospels written. I've read other commentaries that will say it's written even as late as 100 AD. What? This book is unique. It's completely different than the other Gospels in pictures, in styles, and in language. And John's Gospel doesn't have Jesus speaking in parables as much as in speeches. 
Now, there is more interpretation in this gospel with the writer even at times adding comments and explanations. And John's gospel is both historical and theological. Now, all the gospels, in fact, actually have a different purpose. Matthew's purpose was to show how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament's prophecies declaring Christ's kingship. Mark wrote for the Romans presenting Christ as the servant ministering to the people's needs. Luke wrote his gospel for the Greeks, introducing them to the sympathetic son of man. But John's purpose was so specific in nature that he even declares it simply to us, as our sister read this morning in chapter 10, verses 31. And the Bible says, But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. A book for both Jew and Gentile, and Gentile means non-Jew, presenting Jesus as the Son of God. Why? So that we may believe and have life in his name. It's evangelistic in nature. I always encourage, encourage those searching for truth to read the Gospel of John first, or for new believers in Christ to read the Gospel of John first. Now it's interesting, as we kind of lay the foundations, we'll notice that the first chapter of the Gospel of John is so heavy and so laden with many different names and titles, and we can see that, and we're not going to cover that this morning, but I just wanted to throw that out there. We can see that in the first chapter, we see the title, The Word. We see the title, The Light, The Son of God, The Lamb of God, The Messiah, The King of Israel, and The Son of Man, all laid clearly in the first chapter. So, let's begin. I'm going to read the first five, five verses. The Bible says these words, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So many views so many ideas and beliefs and theories taught about the beginning of time. Man has always wanted to know what has happened in the beginning. Some would say, listen, it's a big bang. And if so, what caused the big bang? Somehow order was created out of chaos. Intelligence somehow created out of confusion. Why does man struggle so much with the idea that God spoke and everything was created. Is it that difficult? I heard a preacher once say that man struggles with the idea of a creator because if there is a creator and we were created, maybe then maybe he might have something to say to his creation. And, and mankind doesn't like being told what to do. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was, and He is in the beginning. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit created all things. The three are one, yet individual. Jesus Christ was with God. He coexisted with the Father. He is co-equal with the Father. All things were made by him. Colossians 1 verses 16, the Bible says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. In him was life, the eternal life of God. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What, what does that mean? He is the way, 
to the Father. No man comes to the Father unless it is by Jesus Christ. He is truth, pure, unadulterated truth, perfect in every way, and he is life. Without Christ, there is no life. I, I remember I, I used to hand out a flyer on the streets that simply said, no Christ, N-O, Christ, no life, N-O, life. Or no Christ, K-N-O-W, and no life. He is life. This same life that spoke everything into existence is the same life that opens up the eyes of our souls when we bow our knee to Jesus Christ. Think of it, how dark our life was before Christ. How empty, how void of everything. No matter what we gave ourselves to, whether it was drinking or some maybe drugs or relationships or money, chasing an empty promise for something better, yet there was nothing but simply emptiness, a vacuum that could never be filled. And when we accepted Christ that day, our life was changed. That same life that brought this solar system into existence was birthed into our very hearts. I remember hearing an illustration one day about a child coming home from Sunday school, and he had this look of confusion on his face, and he said, Mom, I'm really confused. And the mother's going, what are you confused about? Well, I learned that God is bigger than the whole universe. The mom goes, yeah, that, that's right. O okay. But I also heard that he lives inside of us. Mom goes, yeah, that, that's, that's right. I'm confused. Why are you confused? Well, if God is bigger than the whole universe and he lives inside of us, shouldn't he shine through? Moving on, verse 5. And the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. The world is spiritually blinded in darkness and the lost simply do not get it. Unless the Lord opens up the heart and the eyes, the individual doesn't understand the gospel. It makes no sense to them. This is why heaven rejoices when one sinner bows their knee before our Savior. It is the greatest miracle. It's bringing light where there once was darkness, life where there once was death, forgiveness and grace when just moments before impeding and impending judgment and wrath. 1 Corinthians verse two, chapter 2, verses 14, the Bible says, The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Moving on, verses 6 in John's Gospel. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of that light, that all through him might believe he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man that comes into the world. Now John here is referred to as John the Baptist. Now we spoke about that a number of weeks ago, so I'll just give you a real brief synopsis or snapshot. So John's name means Jehovah is gracious. He was dedicated to be a Nazarite all of his life. Numbers chapter 6, you can see more about that. He was the same as Samuel and Samson. He wasn't to touch the vine, not have anything, whether drink or food. He shall never cut his hair and he shall never go near a dead body. He would be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. And we can see that in Luke chapter 1, when Elizabeth meets Mary and John in her womb is filled with the Holy Spirit. And he'd be a prophet to present the Son of God to the people of Israel. And we can see that in John chapter 1, 15 onwards. Now, God would use John's ministry to turn many people back to the Lord, just as Isaiah had promised in Isaiah 40. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. So that's a basic snapshot and if you'd like to have a little bit more detail I encourage you to listen to the message given on December the 6th and you can find that on the CCT, CCD YouTube page 
but simply John was before Christ to bear witness of Christ. So verses 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. It's interesting as we read the scripture, some part of the world actually did know him. And, and I love the way Chuck Smith does this. So I'm going to give just quote him in doing this. The forces of nature recognized him, so the wind ceased at his command. In Mark chapter 5, verses 39, Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. So the wind knew who Jesus was. The tree withered at his command. Matthew 21, verses 18, Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And Jesus said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. So the fig tree knew who Jesus was. The stones even knew Christ. When Jesus was coming down from the Mount of Olives and the, mount, and the multitudes cried out to make Jesus king and the crowds were upset, the Pharisees in particular. In Luke 19 verses 40, Jesus said, I tell you, that if these should keep silent, the stones will immediately cry out. So the stones knew who Jesus was. The demons even knew him. When the demoniac of the Gadarean saw Jesus coming from afar, he fell down and worshipped Jesus. And the demon said in Mark 5, verse 7, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. So the demons knew who Jesus was, but those whom he loved, those who he came for, the world of mankind, knew him not. End quote. Verses 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. His own. The Jews rejected him. They had been waiting for the Messiah for nearly 2,000 years, yet they did not know him. But as many as receive Christ, to them he gives the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Verse 13 says, who were born not of blood. Just because mom and dad are born again, it doesn't mean the children are saved. God has no grandchildren, not born of blood. Verse 13 also says, nor the will of the flesh. No matter how much I try in my own strength to achieve salvation based on my righteousness, it simply will not work. I, I heard a preacher say many, many years ago, going to church makes you as much of a Christian just like going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. You can do whatever you want to do. You can achieve whatever traditions you want to achieve. And you still may not make it to heaven. Matthew 7 verses 22 to 23 says, On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. And we cast out demons in your name. And perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's law. And verse 13 also says, nor of the will of man. You know, others may try their hardest. We can be in prayer. Oh, please save him, Lord. Save him, save him, save him, save him. We cannot will somebody else to get saved. It's all of God. It is a gift. It's grace by faith and the only name under heaven by which we can be saved. Did you know that everything in this world, all religions in this world fall under two simple categories? There's only two religions. There's one, the religion of works what we can do, what we can achieve, everything that we can somehow get ourselves right before God. All the religions, no matter what they fall in, or, or are, fall into that category. And then there's one more. Faith in Christ. Christianity. There's only two religions on this earth. I want to close by looking at verses 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. 
the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is one of the greatest mysteries of God. The greatest. First Timothy chapter 3, verses 16. God was manifest in the flesh. This is complete awe. Still to today, it bewilders the mind. And we celebrated Isaiah chapter 7, verses 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And we celebrated this two days ago. We were rejoicing at the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So why? Why was he manifested in the flesh? I just want to look at four really brief scriptures. So he can understand our limitations. He was hungry. He was thirsty. He was tired. He being Christ, he wept. Hebrews 4, verses 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. Another reason is so he can give us a clearer revelation of who God was. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Another reason was so he can show us who the father was. John 14.9 Jesus says he that has seen me has seen the father. As we go through the gospel of John it's one of the, one of the main themes in the gospel is showing us the Father. John 10, verses 30, I and the Father are one. And finally, there's a, a, more than this, but time doesn't permit us to go through that. So he can fulfill the law and pay the penalty for our sin. And not only for our sin, but for the sin of all mankind. All mankind. He was perfect. Spotless Lamb of God who was slain. And his blood, so I want to sing that song, his blood paid the penalty for our sin. And it was shed before the foundations of the world. Jesus was simply born to die and pay the price. And we all know that the scripture says in John 3 16. For God so loved the world, he so loved you and I, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they do not believe in the name of God's one and only son. Can I have every head bowed and every eye closed, please, just for a brief moment in respect to everybody in the room? I was, yesterday, I was thinking about Martin Luther. Martin Luther, in all intents and purposes, would have been classified as the perfect monk. Because if you look at his life, he was very disciplined, fasted often, prayed often. He beat his body physically into subjection, right? But his life was a life of works. And in his testimony, as a, as a monk, as a dedicated priest before the Lord, he was doing everything he could to achieve righteousness. But then he came to a place where he realized that he actually wasn't saved. He came to a place where he realized that it's simply by faith. We can't obtain righteousness by our own good works. It's by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. And his righteousness covers us. His righteousness, his blood covers us and cleanses us from our sin. And I simply want to say to you and encourage you, if you're here, and again, I, I, I'm still learning people's faces, so I don't know everybody here. I don't know if there's a visitor or not. So for the sake of those that might be coming to church because it's 
because it's Christmas and that's this time of the year. If you've spent your life coming to church, maybe, because you thought coming to church will make you right before the Lord, but you have never bowed your knee to Jesus Christ, can I simply give you an opportunity to do that now? And I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you up front. Just raise your hand before the Lord, and we'll simply pray and ask for the Lord's forgiveness. If that's you and you don't know the Lord, with every head bowed and every eye closed, just raise your hand. And I'd be honored, or Tanya would be honored, to pray for you. Amen. Can I have every head up and every eyes up? Isn't our Savior amazing? I, I struggle with communion. You know why I struggle with communion? Because I know how, how unrighteous I am. How much of a sinner I am. And every time I'm confronted with the Word of God and confronted with who I am in the mirror, I, I just, communion makes me so uncomfortable. And then the other side of me thanks the Lord for sending His Son and dying for me. Because without Him, I'd be in hell today. I would be dead today. The life that I was leading before I came to the Lord. And what a wonderful Savior we have. He simply came and He died. He was born to die. Isn't that exciting? That is so exciting. And I just wanted to share that with you this morning as we laid the foundations of the Gospel of John. There's so much amazing truths in the Scripture. And I'm excited to hear what Tanya and Wayne bring forth over the next few months as we go through the Gospel of John. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.